thanks so much for stopping by and uh, checking out this sermon video. Just want to encourage you as you listen to this sermon uh, that this is just a supplement to your faith, to your walk with Jesus. Don't rely on this solely. I just encourage you to get involved in a local church if you uh, already are not. If you are looking for a local church, I'd encourage you to check out Center Point Church. Uh, we'd love to see you uh, be a part of our community. Uh, we have different groups that meet as well uh, throughout the week, Bible studies that uh, you can be a part of. Uh, as well, maybe it's on your heart that you'd like to help us in some way financially. Uh, a lot of man hours go into making our videos, into our production on Sunday morning. And if that's on your heart, check out centerpointchurch.ca and you can see how you could help us as well. You can check out our Facebook page, Center Point Church. Uh, like and follow us. Uh, And if you are watching online, a special welcome to you to our churches in Montague and Charlottetown. Uh, we're going to be in Psalm 103. I'm going to read the first five, five verses today. Then we're going to pray and we're going to just focus on these five verses and what the Spirit of God has to say. So Psalm 103 in our series called Thankful, it says this, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, and who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Those are the verses we're going to focus on. I'll pray for us, and then we'll see what the Spirit of God has to say. Heavenly Father. Thank you for who you are, and as we come to Thanksgiving this year, we just want to be people who have gratitude, people who have not forgotten you, but remember you, just not on this day, but every day, that we would thank you for who you are. Thank you for what you give to us, what we experience as we walk with you, even in this season that we find ourselves in. You're still a good God. You're still worthy of thanksgiving and praise. And I pray that our hearts would be in tune with that today. So make these verses through your spirit come alive to our souls. Uh, revive us, refresh us, encourage us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. A few years ago, two, well, now eight years ago, I read a book in 2012 called The One Minute Manager. It was revised, but it originally came out in 1982. Ken Blanchard wrote it. Uh, sort of focused on leaders to develop this practice. One minute of praising. So I'll explain it. This is for a leader to catch their employees doing something good. And what they would do is they would praise them on the spot. Uh, we're probably used to people catching us doing something wrong and then coming to us on the spot and telling us you're doing that wrong. So what this book was trying to do is what if we focused on catching people in good moments and just in that moment appreciating the good job they're doing? So this actually, though, is more difficult than it seems. So the book was saying how uh, it's an easy concept, but to put into practice can be a challenge because if we were honest, uh, we're probably better at criticism than we are at praise. Uh, I joke, we've joked as pastors over the years that one of the spiritual gifts that maybe the church thinks they have is criticism. Uh, it's very easy to criticize rather than be thankful and rather than praise people. Uh, we're much better at one minute criticizing than we are at one minute praising. Uh, many of us would do well to put this practice into play this week. So think of it this way. Catch someone doing good and on the spot praise them. It could actually uh, revolutionize your marriage, change the way you relate to your children, encourage those who come in contact with or who you work with. Uh, they could also, it could also make you a much nicer person to be around. 
So if you're around people and you're uplifting and you're encouraging, people are just going to be have this tendency where they want to be around you. But it has to be intentional. And it actually applies very much to our relationship with God. Because if we were honest, I think some of us would go, I'm much better at complaining to God than praising God. I'm much better at going to God with these things in my life and just saying, all right, God, here's why this is so bad. Here's why this is so negative. Rather than coming to God and just acknowledging him for who he is and thanking him. Uh, We had a chapel speaker when I was at Bible college come in, and he challenged us in the area of prayer. He said, sometimes in prayer what we do is we run right to God with God do this, God do that, rather than just stopping and adoring God. Like, start, and this is what he said to us, start your prayer with who God is and thanking him for everything that you can think of, his loving kindness, his justice, his faithfulness, that we can trust God, that God forgives. Like, start there, and here's what he said. What you'll find out is by the time you praise God and you get to yourself, uh, you'll realize you don't have that big of issues going on. So praise God, intercede for others, and then he said, then go to yourself, and what you'll realize is your situation isn't as bad as you thought, because praise puts everything in perspective. Worship puts everything in perspective. So catch someone doing something right. Uh, This week, because I knew Thanksgiving was coming up, I focused on reading Numbers chapter 10 to 13, chapters that were filled with complaining people while I studied being thankful. So I balanced it out, and I was like reading about the Israelites in Numbers 10 to chapter 13, when they're in the wilderness and they're just griping and and they're complaining all the time and they're saying things like it was so much better in Egypt, we'd rather the food in Egypt. And God sends manna to them from heaven. He provides for their needs and then he sends quail and they get tired of it. And the Jews are wandering in the wilderness. They're complaining against Moses. They're complaining against God. And then I was like, man, these Israelites complain so much. And God said, so do you. And I was like, ah, it's so like us. Like before we give the Israelites a hard time, we're just like them. Wandering around in the wilderness. There's sometimes in life we look and we go, man, it was so much better back there. But yet God has us right here. And he never changes. And God is still good. See, Unhappy people uh, will have a harder time at doing the one-minute praising or just as if you're not content in life, you'll have a hard time seeing God in the midst of hard circumstances. So sometimes we need to give ourselves a good talking to. Uh, Psalm 103 is all about that. David is writing it, but it's like he's preaching to his own soul. He's talking to his own soul, and he's reminding himself to bless the Lord. I don't know if you ever get there where you have to remind yourself, like, praise God. How he, like, thank God. Uh, Not only that, bless the Lord for all his benefits that he's given to you. Like, think about what we really deserve and think about what we have. Bless the Lord because of all his benefits. I think uh, many of us should give God a one-minute praising. Like, that shouldn't be hard, right? Like, this week, if you got alone every day and you just said, for one minute, I'm going to praise God. I'm just going to thank him for who he is, what he's given me in my life, because we're sure good at telling God what we want him to do for us, but do we ever stop and go, I'm just going to acknowledge you for who you are. So I call our attention to this because we're celebrating Thanksgiving. We're going to sit around tables if we already haven't. We'll have our family. We'll have our friends. We'll have a bunch of food. And around some tables, I know what normally happens is they go around and they'll go, name one thing you're thankful for. That's easy, right? Like You should be able to nail that one. If you're a Christ follower, you should be able to go, that's easy. And then... uh, 
we're gathering around, we're trying to focus on being thankful. So in order to focus our hearts for the month of October, I want to focus on just being thankful. Because right now, with everything, there's a lot of negativity, right, in our world with COVID and the regulations and the chaos in our world. It's so easy to just get discouraged. And it's so easy to give up hope. But yet, if we follow Jesus, we have so much hope in the midst of chaos, in the midst of craziness. So I've been trying to tune my heart coming into October to just be, be thankful. How we be thankful for who God is and what God has done for you. Charles Spurgeon calls Psalm 103 a Bible within itself. He said, it contains too much for a thousand pens to write. So if you were to read these 22 verses, you'll have David talk about personal. Then in verses 6 to 18, he'll talk about the national, meaning he'll focus on the Israelites. And then in verses 19 to 22, he focuses on this universal concept that all created beings should praise God. They should praise God. He begins by calling us to wholehearted, intentional praise to God. So we need a good dose of Psalm 103 to wash away our complaining spirit and replace it with a heart of gratitude. So David says things like this. Let all that is within me praise his holy name. Everything within me praise his holy name. Forget not all his benefits. So here's what we got to do. We got to think before we thank. We got to ponder before we can praise, and we must remember before we can rejoice. So if you think, and over your life, you will thank God for what he's done in your life. If you ponder, stop and just, in a way, meditate on those things, let them come into your mind, and then think them through, you will then praise God for what he's done, and then you'll remember all of that, and you'll rejoice. So... Here's five blessings we get, and I've titled this message just blessed. If you follow Jesus, you're blessed. Five things we get because of what Jesus has done. First thing is pardon. It says, who forgives all your iniquity? Think about that. Who forgives all your sins? And David starts here. It's no surprise that he starts here because this is the foundation for everything else. Our greatest problem is the guilt we feel because of our sin. That's our greatest problem. It's sin, and what do I do with my sin? And we live in a culture that tells us to work to get rid of your sin. We live in a culture that says sin's not a big issue. Where the Bible would go, you do not work to get rid of your sin, and sin is the major issue. So David starts here, and he says, we have a God who forgives all our iniquity. Notice that, all our iniquity. Let that just sink in. Because if we were honest, even this week, We've committed sins that we know we shouldn't have committed. Or, the Bible even goes here, we should have done things that we didn't even think about. And those are sins of omission. So we have sins of commission and we have sins of omission. We have sins that we know if I do that, that would be sinful, that would be wrong. And then we have sins such as this. I know I should do the right thing, but I refuse to do the right thing. Or I don't see that I should do the right thing and we omit it. So we battle all this sin. Uh, many of us, we've really blown it big time when it comes to the area where we messed up over and over again. Uh, sometimes I'm like, why do I repeat the same dumb things over and over? Do you ever go there? Like, you're like, man, I have such a poor attitude, but this week I'm not going to. And by the end of the week, you're like, I did it again. My attitude was horrible. We do this over and over, but yet, hear the good news of the gospel. God forgives all your iniquity, all your sin. So I'm glad the word all is included because it means that God intends to forgive our future sin. Sometimes when we come to the gospel, 
we, we get the idea that God forgives our past sin. Like some of us, we would go up until the point of Jesus have committed sin, that maybe we have guilt and shame, and the gospel would go, I free you of that, you're rescued from that. But we forget this point, that not only does God forgive our past sin, but he, he forgives our present sin. He forgives our future sin. Like, we're going to commit sin in the future. We sit here today, you watch online today, and you don't even know what those sins are, but God's already forgiven them. Like, think about the gospel. Like, that covers you. That doesn't mean, hey, now that God's forgiven all your iniquity, go live as you want. No, grace would cause you to go, wow, he's forgiven my past, my present, my future. So when I mess up, I can rise again because of his grace. I don't have to wall, sort of wallow in my past sin of guilt and shame in the present because he set me free. I go, what a God we serve. Like, what amazing grace. What tender mercy does he pour out on us that he forgives all our sins, past, present, and future. Uh, here's something you need to know about God. He's eager to forgive. He's ready to forgive. And he wants to forgive you. It amazes me how many people have believed the lie that because of what I've done, I don't think God can forgive me. And yet God goes, I'm pursuing you, and I will forgive you. I'm eager, I'm ready, and I want to forgive you. So if you are being beat up because of sin in your life, let the chains go. Get freedom in the person of Jesus Christ and walk into who he's called you to be. David also goes, who heals all your diseases. So, I'll touch on this because ultimately we have a God who heals. We have a God who can take away sickness and pain. Uh, however, when it comes to God and healing, we know the ultimate end is we will be with him in heaven and there will be no more sickness, no more disease, no more death. So on this earth right now, we have people, and some of us may be watching or listening today, uh, we are battling disease, we are battling illness, but I never want you to lose this sight, that God can heal, that you can go to God, that you can seek that out, persevere in prayer. However, on this side of heaven, we don't got a guarantee that we'll always be healed physically, but God has a way to work this so that someday sin doesn't win. Someday we will be in perfectness. We will have no issues with our body, with our health. So think about that. I remember in 2015 uh, when my stepdad was battling cancer, I'd go into the hospital. I'd place my hand on him and I would pray that God would heal him. Ultimately, he passed away with cancer. God didn't heal him this side of heaven. So I had to come back to my doctrine of God and go, oh, but I know that today... Kenny is praising God in perfectness, no sickness, no disease. God has healed him. This side of heaven, he made a different decision, and I have to come to that realization that God did not heal him here on this earth, but today, he's where I want to be, and he's got better health than I'll ever have while I'm even here talking to you today. So ultimately, David goes, who heals all your diseases? Does God heal? Absolutely. But he's sovereign in that. Sometimes God comes into a situation and he just heals them completely. Other times we get healed through the wisdom of doctors and nurses. So I'm grateful that I can go to the doctor uh, at times. I know as men, we, we don't go as often maybe as we should. Uh, and I'm just speaking. I need to book an appointment now that I brought that up. Uh, but like Friday, I had this headache. So I took some Tylenol, and it helped, and my headache went away. And I go, God even uses the medicine to help heal us. So all healing is divine. God has given people wisdom in our day to help us in that area. I'm grateful for them. I pray as we go for checkups, as we go to seek counsel, that we bring God into it. And ultimately, 
Uh, it's not the doctors or nurses who we raise at the number one spot. It's God. We're always saying, God, could you heal me? God, can you come into this situation? Could you heal my friend? Could you heal my friend, uh, family? However that plays out, it's all divine healing. God's in charge of that. David then goes and talks about deliverance. He says this, who redeems your life from the pit? To redeem means to rescue from danger in the time of trouble. So who rescues you from the pit? This benefit may be hard to grasp. So I want you to think of your odometer uh, in, your, in your car. Like, think about all the cars maybe you've driven over the years, and yet some of us sit here today, those of you watching online, you're still here. As a driver, I've made some really stupid decisions. My driving hasn't been flawless. Uh, sometimes I think it's pretty good, and then I do something, I'm like, oh, Howie, that's totally on you. And then other people have done things on the road, but yet here we are, we sit here today. So think about all the miles you've put on driving. We've driven places, we got out of the car, and I don't know if you ever had this thought, if you, if you didn't, that's awesome, but if you did, we need extra prayer, uh, where we've driven, got out of the car, and we were like, uh, I don't even remember driving here. Not that you were clueless, it was just, it's so familiar that you just drive it, and you're just so familiar with it. And I'm thinking of that, and I'm going, wow, like the times God has, I believe, encamped angels around my car. There's moments where I walked away from, I'm like, I don't know how I got out of that except it was the hand of God. So we all sit here. So I want us to think about that today because uh, God ordained the moment you were born and God has ordained the moment you will die. So all of us who live have this time period. We come into the world and God knows when we'll go out. Think about that. In a way... It's not like you're a superhero, but you're invincible until that day. Meaning, God has a plan for you, and when he sees fit, he'll take you out. He's ordained all of that. He's ordained your life. He's planned your life. So think through this with me, right? We sit here today, and God's in charge of everything. And some of us are thinking, well, God's not really doing anything in my life. Oh, trust me. He's keeping together your life right now. He's putting all the pieces together. He's lining it all up. So not one of us in this room are guaranteed our next breath. We're not guaranteed tomorrow. So we can make plans, but here's the reality of Scripture. Uh, we have no clue what tomorrow brings. We don't know. All it could be is a visit to the doctor. All it could be is a phone call. So think all of this through. Like, we sit here today, uh, no one has maybe, like, robbed you, you weren't fired, your arthritis flared up or your arthritis didn't flare up, but yet you're here. Uh, no one scammed you on the internet, though some people tried. Your identity wasn't stolen as far as you know. Uh, many of you, you'll go back to, many of us will go back to our homes today. We have money, we have friends, uh, and on and on it goes. Think of all the bad things that could have happened but didn't happen, even this week. The fact that you think nothing happened today means that God has been doing his job. I call this the doctrine of perpetual preservation. It means that while we're here on earth with all its dangers and trouble, God's constantly working behind the scenes. God's constantly involved in your life, and he'll give you strength for each new day. If we could only see life as God does, uh, I think some of us would be terrified, first of all. But if we could see life as God does, it, that it's a step-by-step, moment-by-moment walk with him, we would be free. That we would be free of anxieties, that we'd be free of worries to a great extent. Not saying that you'll never battle fear, anxiety, that stuff's true, but you'll bring it to God, step-by-step. Now we see David. He goes here. He says this. Who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy? Uh, the other night, I watched Chronicles of Narnia, 
And uh, there was a, a moment in the movie where uh, they sort of get knighted and they get acknowledged as kings and queens. And I love that scene in, in the movie because uh, Aslan, who's a lion in the movie, is really a depiction of Jesus. That's what C.S. Lewis meant to do in that. And he anoints them King Peter, right? Queen Lucy. And, and I'm like, it's such a beautiful moment. Because it's this, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy? It's the loyal, unending, unchanging love of God towards us. Like God heaps up blessings and then he pours them out on us if we're found in Christ. Then he crowns us with tender mercies. Why doesn't he say tender justice? Because there is nothing tender about justice. See, mercy implies I failed. Mercy implies I'm defeated. And yet he crowns me with tender mercy. It means he knows what we're going through. Not only that, he meets us where we are. So God knows me. He knows my fears. He knows my concerns. He knows what I'm feeling. And he pursues me and meets me where I am. If we were to receive what we truly deserve from God, we would not stand a chance. Like, let's be honest. If we got what we deserved, it would be hell. That's what we deserve. But by the grace of God, he brings us off the road if we are found in his son Jesus and we get more than we ever deserved. He rescues us. See, this crown reminds us of our position as children of God. So in our day, only kings and queens wear crowns, but it is the privilege of every Christian to be crowned with loving kindness and the tender mercy of God. If that doesn't change your identity, I don't know what will. That you are a king, that you are a queen because of what Jesus has done for you. Let that sink in. Let that lead to a thankfulness for what God has done. Then David says this, Who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like eagles? The passage says, satisfies you with what? Good. Who satisfies you with good? That means there is nothing on earth that can satisfy us deeply except God himself. Now, there's things in life we all want. There's things I go, man, if I had that in my life, I think I'd be happy to have that. But here's what we find, even when we get some of those things. So my earliest memory for, for this was like in the 80s when the Nintendo came out. I'm like, man, if I get a Nintendo, my life as a child is going to be so awesome. And then you get the Nintendo and you play it. And then all of a sudden, a week later, you're like, mom, I'm bored. Like, this is sort of how life goes, right? Those things you think will make you happy or fulfilled ultimately leaves you empty. So David says, there's really nothing on earth that satisfies, and the good of verse 5 actually comes from God, not from anything we see around us. So, one translation says, he fills my life with good things, but the emphasis is not on what we possess, but on what? Who possesses us? The reason he fills our life with good is because we have relationship with God. So when I experience things in this world and I bring God into the picture, I get to what? Be grateful and thankful for them. So those of you who are married, you're grateful for your spouse. Those of you who have children, you're grateful for your spouse. But now you bring God into it and he changes everything for his glory and his honor. Now, some of us, we have possessions, and that's not sinful or wrong, but when we have God in the midst of it, we go, I get to enjoy those for his glory. I get to enjoy those. But if we're being biblical, which we always should be, God gives them and we just manage them. Eugene Peterson captures this nicely. He says, he wraps you in goodness, beauty eternal. See, to be satisfied means to be so full you need nothing else. You need nothing else. So if you have Jesus, you have everything. It's sort of 
what happens at the end of Thanksgiving dinner. So some of us will eat that today. Some of us will eat it tomorrow. Tons of food. You might have two, three plates. You load up the gravy. You go to town. Pumpkin pie comes out. You don't stop at one. You have two. I know growing up, the big thing to do was if you fell full, you just undo that top button of your pants because it was told to you that if you do that, you could fit more in. So many people, I've witnessed it, have even done that. And yet, you eat, it's good, you're thankful, but time goes on and here's what normally happens in the evening. You're like, man, I'm hungry again. I think I want a turkey sandwich. So you eat a turkey sandwich. And for the next week, you eat multiple turkey sandwiches because they're really good after Thanksgiving. But here's the reminder. So this year, as you're eating your turkey sandwich, just remember, the true Thanksgiving meal didn't satisfy you. You became hungry again. However, God fulfills you. God satisfies you. And when you get that, you'll need nothing else in your life to bring satisfaction. So it is with everything the world offers. Like, we're here today, and we're gone tomorrow. That's life. It happens quickly. Uh, God says to his fading, frail, perishing children, I will give you whatever you need so you can soar like an eagle. Think about that. No matter what stage we are in life, all of us need this. Like, I need to know this. There is a way to renew yourself, your energy, your outlook, your attitude. And I'm just not talking about physically because reality is we all will get older. We all will age. Our bodies will fail us. If they haven't failed us yet, they're going to fail us at some point. But this verse doesn't change. God will renew you. Isaiah 40, 31, right? Those who mount up with wings like eagles, they shall run, they shall not faint. There is something about God carrying us through life no matter what age we're at. Uh, I was just thinking of this a couple of weeks ago. Uh, Charles Stanley just retired in a way from being the pastor of the church. It doesn't mean he's done a ministry. He's just stepping down. 88 years old, 49 years in the same church, he steps down, but I'm like, this verse, he's been an example. The God will give you strength. He will renew your energy. And, and no matter what stage we're in, so I'm, I'm at this place in my life where I'm just praying constantly, God, as long as you have me here, as long as you're giving me breath, give me the energy to serve you. Give me the energy to serve you well. And I said this in our first service, like, I sort of break up my life in decades. So when I turn 20, I think, okay, what am I going to do in my 20s? What am I going to do in my 30s? Now, what am I going to do in my 40s for the mission of God? And I want to pour all my energy in, so much so that if I'm just in something where I'm not pouring myself out, I don't want to waste my life. I want to go, okay, God, you have me here. You have me in this stage of life for a reason, for a purpose. And all of us need to think this way. See, some people in the church just come to a point and they go, I put in my time. No, Christian. Your time's at the end when God calls you home. Now, you might physically have not as much energy, but it doesn't mean God doesn't want to use you and raise you up so you can soar like an eagle. So... That's the reality of life. When you're in your 70s, you're probably not going to be doing what you did in your 20s in energy. However, who knows what God will do? Because I'd tell you, I know people who uh, have a ton more energy than I do, uh, and God in his grace is using them in powerful and unique ways. God goes, I'll give you whatever you need so you can soar like the eagle. Uh, so there's a way to renew yourself, your energy, your outlook, and your attitude. I tell you this, it's actually better than exercise. It's uh, cheaper than healthy food, because healthy food is super expensive in the day we live. Uh, it's quicker than dieting, and it's all uh, better than strenuous jogging or running. Now, some people love to run. God bless you in that. Uh, I've hit a stage in my life where I'm like, if I just do a light jog, I'm good. But think about this. Spiritually, there is something better. And what is this miracle cure? Here it is. Fill your life with thankfulness 
for God's good gifts to you. Just be thankful for everything God has given to you. If you will let him, the Lord will give you something the world cannot match, and that result will be this energy and this strength that when I am weak, he is strong, and I can cling to it. God says, I want to satisfy you, not with gold, but with good, not with that which glitters today and is gone tomorrow, but with that which is permanent, eternal, ever-increasing in value. God intends to give us Contentment, satisfaction, significance, strength, passion. So now we come to the end of what David has wrapped up in these five verses. They form a perfect summary of thanksgiving for anyone who wants to wake up their soul and praise God. Here it is. Here's the five benefits that I've talked about. You get pardon from sin. You can find healing in God. You get deliverance, you get crowned, and you have satisfaction. If you don't know where to begin in praising God, start right here. God, you forgave my sin. God, no matter what I face in life, I can seek you for healing. God, you deliver me. God, you crown me with tender mercy. And God, I find true satisfaction in you. See, people who follow Jesus who are content, are the ones who see God in everything and everywhere, who understand that circumstances are fingerprints of God and seeing him in the best, even in the worst. Uh, I'm grateful for people I have in my life who see the best in the worst because so often we're filled with negatives. So often we just read or we watch the news and we're just downhearted and we need people to come and say, oh, no, no. God's got a great plan. He's got a great purpose. Even in the chaos, even in this season in our world where things don't make sense, God has a plan. We're going to come out of this, and God's going to go, that's what I was doing. That was the work I had planned. And we're going to be grateful for it. Now, over time, we go where we are right now, we're not really grateful. Uh, So we got to tune our hearts to praise God. So what is the application to this message? It's not hidden. It's not complex. Uh, It actually seems more important to me today than it did 20 years ago because as the years roll on, life teaches you some important lessons. Uh, Here's what you learn. Not all your dreams will come true. So when you were younger, you were like, life's going to go like this and this, and you're all like, let's go. And then I'd say you get 10 minutes into that, and you're like, my dream didn't happen. It didn't come true. So life has a way to show you that your dreams don't come true. Could I tell you that's a good thing? Okay? That not everything you want will happen the way you want it to happen. That not everything you ask for will be given to you in that way. What you have in the promises of God, you can bank on that, okay? You can hold to that. But those things we think, like life's going to go this way, I'm going to be married, we're going to have a family, all of that can play out. And some people, that happens. Some, it doesn't. But life has a way to show you not all your dreams come true. So the wise among us have learned to thank God for prayers that God never answered. I, I don't know if you ever thank God for that. I know I have. I'm like, God, what was I thinking? Why was I praying that? Thank you. Thank you that you didn't say yes to that. Or are you thanking God for things, uh, dreams that you had that didn't even come your way, but it's a blessing they didn't? You need to be there. You need to get your heart in that position. See, it's a good thing to dream big dreams, to imagine all that you might be someday, uh, So if you don't know where to begin in applying this message, let's circle back to the beginning. Here's your challenge. Thanksgiving, today, tomorrow, and this week, catch your spouse doing something right. So wives, be ready. Husbands, be ready. And here's what you're going to do. One minute praising. When you see them doing something right, do this every day. Catch them doing something right. they got to at least do it once. Okay? It's going to happen. They're going to remember something. And, 
And I know some of you are like, man, this is going to be a challenge because how do I catch him doing something right? You will. It's going to be there. And then praise him. Catch your children doing something right and give them a one-minute praising. Catch your friends doing something right and give them a praising. Catch your coworkers or people you work with doing something right and just praise them on the spot. See, when you do give them one minute praising, that alone will do your soul good. It'll also focus on the positive and lift your spirits. And for some, I'm sure your spouse will just be totally thrown off. They'll be like, what, what do you want? What's this about? What are you doing? But then give God a one minute praising after that. So catch them doing something good, praise them, and then go off on your own and just praise God. One minute. Do it once a day for this week. I know it sounds small, but try praising the Lord for one minute every day this week, and here's what you'll find. It'll strengthen your heart. It'll bring you closer to God. You will be more grateful and more thankful. See, there's two kinds of people in the world. Those who dwell on what they want and those who dwell on what they have. What do you have that God has blessed you with? And how do you thank him and praise him? See, as we celebrate Thanksgiving this year, and as we count our blessings, and the old hymn would say, count our blessings and what? Name them one by one. When we do that this year, let us join the ranks of those who dwell on what they have. And by doing that, they glorify God. And get this. They enjoy Jesus. Do you enjoy Jesus? He's pardoned you. He's healed you. He's delivered you. He's crowned you with tender mercy. And he's satisfied you with everything you need. Second Peter would tell us that God has given us everything we need for a life of righteousness. You have it if you're found in Christ. Let's pray in close. Heavenly Father, thank you for who you are. Thank you for your goodness, for your grace. And God, I pray on this Thanksgiving day that our hearts would be in tune with gratitude. I pray as we celebrate with our family, our friends, that we would be so grateful, Jesus, for what you've given to us. I pray that we'd be people who praise you, who praise others, who are just people that, man, I'd just say, like, that we want to be around, that in our presence, people would be drawn to the person of Jesus. Too many Christians are downcast. Too many Christians are critical, negative. But Jesus, you've given us everything. So allow us to live that out with hope, with purpose, with meaning. In his name we pray, amen. Amen.